A few weeks ago, I was privy to a conversation with a pastor of color, a friend who I have a lot of respect for. The race issue had reached a boiling point, and he started to describe some of his conversations on social media. He talked about speaking out and some of the frustrating feedback he would began to receive from someone in a former church of his. Wrinkles started to form on his brow as the seasoned and typically calm pastor described the interaction in detail. He was uncharacteristically flustered, and almost as if acknowledging what was boiling underneath, he said, you know, usually I like to play the long game, but something feels different now. That stuck with me for a while, and I began to wonder exactly how his quick game might be different. Maybe it involved more direct statements and showed less curiosity for the other person's position. Maybe it cut out the moments one would look for to celebrate common ground. I can't really imagine it, but what if his quick game included some accusations, disassociation, or even, God forbid, a call to socially cancel the person? That would be extreme for my friend. But the truth is, if those thoughts had past my friend's mind, I get that. I've had similar feelings. There is something in me too when I hear something I disagree with on the news or from one of my friends that jumps up and says, yeah, but that urge seems to be even stronger when I'm not sitting right next to them. My fingers hover over my keyboard ready to craft the perfect response that's going to rock the internet, get nothing but positive feedback, and change the world. And then I think better about it. I remember my epic failures. I I remember only opening up a can of worms. But if you're like me, that urge still pops up from time to time because of this insistent belief that words matter and that I can make a difference. And that urge is fueled by something inside of me that sees an injustice in action or thought and wants to cry out by saying, that's not right. Chances are in the chaos and confusion we've experienced in the world lately, you've had a desire to add your two cents. Perhaps you've watched the video of George Floyd dying and you felt sick to your stomach. That's not right, you wanted to say. And you wanted to do something about it. Maybe some of you have watched the riots. You heard the story of the black officer who was shot by a targeted attack against police. And there was something in you that said, that's not right. A couple of months ago, even before the news broke about George Floyd, we talked about weeding through the noise and the importance of making wise choices regarding how we talk about people and issues so that we could be good for the world by speaking good into the world. In many ways, it was an invitation to disengage from some of the hot button issues and refuse to get swallowed up by them. But what happens when the world has had enough, when injustice has gone too far, when we've been brought to the very brink? Is there a way to engage the world that will bring meaningful change? Maybe you're a parent or a grandparent who is concerned about the next generation and wants them to be productive and positive influences for their communities in the days to come. Perhaps you're a son or daughter who's worried your parents don't get the moral issues of the day and are hindering important progress. If you happen to be in any relationship whatsoever whom you have a fundamental disagreement with, I'm really glad that you're here because here's what's at stake. If we don't think carefully about how we're going to bring about change, Some of those relationships that are on the brink now aren't going to be there in the the future. And perhaps even worse, some of those relationships you feel are safe and secure will be gone. Many of you know that's true because there are important relationships you once had that fell apart or naturally slipped away because of some ideological difference. Unfortunately, silence doesn't always help either. Simple silence might preserve a relationship, but if we really care about real change, then we'll be divided internally and our relationships will be hollow. Is there a way to engage the world that will bring meaningful change? It turns out that we aren't the first people to struggle with questions like these. 
In the late first century, Christianity had spread throughout Asia Minor and Europe, but that spread had cost them. They went through considerable seasons of persecution, and all of that seemed to climax under the Emperor Nero in the 60s when he burned down Rome and pinned it on the Christians at the time. Both the apostles Peter and Paul lost their lives during that wave of persecution. And persecution would continue until the 90s. But people weren't dying like they had been dying then. Perhaps that indicated to some that things would finally be getting better, that there was an end to these difficult days in sight. But then something happened in the city of Pergamum. The church had lost one of their own there. A man by the name of Antipas was put to death simply for his faithful witness to Jesus. News of it began to spread throughout Asia Minor. And I have a good hunch that a good number of them were starting to second-guess their decisions to follow Jesus. Wasn't Jesus supposed to come back and make sense of this mess? How much longer do we have to wait for justice to come? How much longer do we have to wait for better days? How much longer until the people who have done this will get what they deserve? How long, O oh Lord? That happens to be the central question of the Bible's last book, How Long? The book of Revelation is exceedingly difficult to comprehend. The theologian John Calvin wrote commentaries on most of the Bible, but skipped Revelation, saying, I don't understand it. I've been a part of multiple churches who have all prohibited their small groups from tackling it. And I get it. With so many interpretations and challenges, it seems to be a fool's errand to interpret it accurately. But the book of Revelation also comes with a promise of blessing for those who read it. Would we want to deny ourselves a blessing that even a partial understanding of the book might yield? Well, we, we can't uncover all of the challenges in Revelation or even attempt to treat the different positions with any sense of fairness in a short message. But for a community that was wrestling with justice in many ways that are similar to our own struggles today, exploring that central question might yield some valuable insight for us. The book of Revelation is the recorded vision given to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos. It begins with a brief introduction and an address to seven churches in Asia Minor. And then it gets really weird. The, the Apostle is taken on this visionary ride like something out of a science fiction movie. Only it's not science fiction, it's symbolic. And, it, and each scene is important and represents something most often something that was yet to come for the first readers. In one of those vital scenes early on, we encounter our key question. John is taken up to heaven and sees the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained under an altar. The altar invokes sacrificial imagery. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Now that question might seem a little harsh, but even in our present calls for justice, we aren't calling for pleasantries. When a life is unjustly taken, a return to normal for those that took it is out of the question. That's why even in the movies where bad guys turn around for the good, there has to be consequences when atrocities have been committed. Spoiler alert from 1983. Darth Vader had to die. There's no other way to write that movie. Our consciences would not have been satisfied with any other ending. And then a voice responds, suggesting that the souls sitting under the altar weren't asking the wrong question either. John writes, Each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Now there's some good news and some bad news with a little bit more bad news about that response. First, the good. God will bring justice. It will happen. But the bad news is that more Christians have to die. The reason for that might be implied here and stated elsewhere. God holds his justice back until people have gone past 
some unknown, undisclosed point of return. He has put the restraint of all restraints on his justice. The other bit of bad news for John's readers and for us, to be frank, is that this doesn't seem to be all that great of an answer. I mean, it's logically, it's logically sound, I suppose, but these men and women were robbed of their lives, and, and the churches would have been robbed of brothers, mothers, children, and sisters. Sometimes those logical answers aren't enough, especially when it's accompanied by a greater cost. Is it possible that there's, there's a fuller answer? Something that's a little bit more palatable ahead? In Revelation chapter 10, John is given a vision of a giant angel with his right foot planted on the sea and, the, and his left foot planted on the land. This is like the incredible Hulk of angels. He has this little scroll in his hand. Then the angel says, there will be no more delay. The mystery of God will be accomplished. Then another voice comes from heaven and tells John to take the scroll and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. Well, it happens just as the voice says. In this mysterious moment that has no direct explanation, John puts the scroll in his mouth and it tastes sweet. When he swallows it, it turns his stomach sour. And then he's told to prophesy again against many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. What could this mean? Well, there's a good chance that this is an emotional answer to the question posed in chapter 6. It's linked by the promise that there is no more delay in the command to prophesy against the nations. The consumption of the scroll is a, a literal taste of justice. Justice is sweet to the lips. It's good, it's right, and we are right to want it. But there's another truth to justice which explains why God delays and plays the long, long game. It is also sickening. Even in our justice system, we aren't throwing faceless individuals into correction facilities. They are human beings created in the image of God. They're husbands and fathers taken away from their families. Even if the justice is good, there is something that should be simultaneously repulsive about it to our souls. Our community was hit by tragedy a year ago when an off-duty police officer struck and killed a young woman while driving under the influence. Shortly after, I met the family that lost their daughter, and I grieved with them and prayed with them for justice. But as I imagined the hammer coming down and a family losing someone perhaps for the rest of their life because of a terrible decision, part of me also felt sick. God delays justice because justice is the end of mercy. And that tells us something very important about God that can reframe all of our relationships and give us a chance to bring about the best in people. God plays the long game with people, knowing that doing so gives him the best possible opportunity to bring about change. And playing the long game is the best possible hand God has given us to do the same. The long game wins. The long game wins because the kind of heart change required for justice in the world is the kind that only God can provide through the Holy Spirit. Yesterday I spent a few hours studying Micah 6.8 because it has been at the heart of this justice discussion. And what does the Lord require of you to promote justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? The NIV and the KJV both translate the word hesed mercy. But I was curious and found that most translations translate that word kindness, and two of them consider it to be faithfulness, which is the way that the word is normally used. In fact, I couldn't find any other times that the word was used as mercy. It makes good sense in the context because Micah is accusing leaders of taking bribes to bring about unfair judgments. And then the supposed spiritual leaders are turning to God and relying on sacrifices to cover their sins. In response, Mike calls them to produce justice instead of denying it and love faithfulness to God instead of loving his forgiveness only. But what struck, them, what struck me the most is that Micah does not just want them to be faithful. He gives them no room to go through the motions. He is commanding them to love faithfulness. That's because true change starts there. 
And that can only come through the prompting of the Holy Spirit that awakens our souls from sleep. When we engage people assuming that our logic alone will win the day, we misunderstand a basic theological truth. Another power has to be involved and received. The long game gives room for that and creates room for that. It doesn't reject people who disagree. It creates space for them to wrestle. And it's faithful, steady, loving presence stirs curiosity and engagement. The long game wins because it humanizes people. We might initially engage people with different opinions with the best of intentions. But when our argument receives a return volley, it's natural to become defensive. And our initial reaction is to win the argument instead of winning the person. Sometimes it's important to lose a few battles in order to win the big one. But we have to know what, or better yet, who we're trying to win. And we have to know for what good we are trying to win them. A week ago, I ran across a post from a college acquaintance who is very vocal about politics and generally not in a kind or endearing way. I caught an article he posted and opened up the comment section for the show. When I was... When I, I saw something so shocking that I would have spit out my coffee if I was a coffee drinker, a friend of his commented saying that he doesn't usually comment on political posts, but based on current events, he would vote a certain way that surely wouldn't make my friend happy, and that it wasn't even close. My friend said this, I understand why you would preface it that way. <clears throat> How about this? I promise not to make this a debate. I'm curious. You tell me why you feel the way that you do, and I will like the comment and not even respond. That was the most surprising thing I've seen on social media in some time. He created space to listen to an opposing viewpoint without stirring up debate or hostility. He didn't get, he didn't get the opportunity to defend his point. He didn't win the battle for the day, but he made an emotionally intelligent move that perhaps protected something more important and preserved it for another discussion on another day. Lastly, the long game wins because it gives us the space we might need to change our minds. Chances are that there are some things that I'm going to think and believe that I don't think and believe now. Is it possible as you look over the course of your life that, and see how your thoughts have developed and changed that there is still room for you to grow? in your thoughts about God and humanity even still. A few weeks ago, someone made a thoughtful point on Twitter about one of the parables of Jesus as it related to the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter controversies. Jesus in Luke 15, 100 sheep, but one goes missing. Jesus leaves the 99 and goes after the one. The 99 say, but what about us? Don't we matter? Of course the 99 still matter but they are not the ones in danger. The one is. Another pastor was commissioned to put this, this powerful point into picture form. Pastor Brian brought it up earlier, and I personally ran across it a few days before. What a simple and powerful truth to speak into today, I thought, that, that draws right from one of Jesus' evocative stories. I, too, had never thought about it that way. And the principle is undoubtedly true and illustrated elsewhere in other stories like Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, who is the surprise hero willing to help a victim in need. But then I became a little curious and wondered if there was something more to the passage that we'd missed. A second look proved that Jesus' application was far more controversial in his day and perhaps far more controversial in ours than the first reading suggested. You see, the one sheep that Jesus leaves in 99 to go help isn't the victim. It's the victimizer. He concludes his parable by saying, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The one sheep is the sinner. The one sheep is the racist. The one sheep is the abusive cop. The one sheep is the rioter. The one sheep is the cop killer. That's tough to swallow, isn't it? But when I think about God's justice and how good and right it is, I can't help but think that his justice is also hard to swallow too. 
The long game gives us a window not just to win people on the fringe. It also gives us the opportunity to, to win people who are, who are nearly off the cliff. Do you know that, Jesus, that grace never appears on Jesus' lips in the New Testament? Grace never appears on his lips. But there is grace all over his actions. And when we play the long game, perhaps our hearts will be filled with more of the same thing and will be changed as well. In 2019, Avengers Endgame was released in theaters. And it made $2.798 billion, just edging out the previous top earner by a few hundred thousand dollars. It broke a record that had been untouchable for 10 years in a declining market of movie theater attendance. How in the world did it do it? Endgame was the culmination of a 22-movie story arc that began 10 years prior. The filmmakers took things slow. They paid attention to each character and gave them unique, incredible stories. They didn't rush to the finale. They slowly built out their universe until they could bring everything together in one incredible payoff for fans. And it paid off, literally. They played the long game because they weren't satisfied with something less. And that's the same thing that can happen in our relationships and in our communities. Can you imagine celebrating common ground when you find it, when you find it in some of the biggest disagreements? What kind of opportunities could you open up by trying to understand where people are coming from emotionally instead of drawing quick conclusions? What kind of reactions might you get if you showed someone curiosity toward a point they knew you disagreed with? How might saying, I don't know, or you might be right on that one, build trust where it's otherwise fragile? By playing the long game, is it possible that we could bring life and change to someone we'd otherwise have missed? Megan grew up in the Westboro Baptist cult, memorizing Bible verses during the time when social media started its rise. She was uniquely suited to share the church's message of hate via Twitter in between the church's protests of military funerals. Her Twitter followers quickly grew with the media attention. Her account even became the subject of Hollywood celebrities. They lavished hate on her as she threw it right back. No matter, she thought, as long as she was on the side of God's word, she felt confident in pressing on. But that started to change when she reached out to a Jewish, Jewish person to condemn him. David Abbott Bull had some experience dealing with hate groups, and instead of writing her off, he engaged. Uh, I knew he was evil, but he was friendly, so I, so I was especially wary because you don't want to be seduced away from the truth by a crafty deceiver, Megan said. The conversation continued over Twitter and email for some time. They both passionately disagreed, but they still engaged in a friendly manner. Abbott Bull could read his Bible from Hebrew, so often he'd counter one of Megan's arguments with a, that's not what the Hebrew says. Megan figured she needed to learn Hebrew, so she bought a course to help her out. But she still ended up asking David for help. It turned out that it was a lot easier to it was a lot easier than consulting some curriculum anyway. Those conversations softened Megan and enabled her to engage someone else on the outside too. The man initially reached out to her via Twitter to express his disagreement with the cult, but the conversation quickly turned. Megan, rec Megan recounts. I asked him some kind of pointed question about the Bible. He said something like, I can't answer that, but I have never been beaten in words with friends. And with that, a friendship started to be laid over the popular Scrabble app. Over the course of several years, a few faithful people who engaged in a friendly way without abandoning their principles led Megan on a journey to walk away from the cult. It wasn't the voices that returned fire with fire. It was the patient few who consistently engaged and played the long game when no one else would. What relationship comes to your mind that you would love to see better? What kind of precipice would you love for someone you care about to walk away from? Is it possible that God could use you to help someone you love know the truth and live a whole and complete life? Is it possible that God could use you to help someone you don't even know yet 
live a more just and equitable life, not out of the fear of being canceled, but out of an honest and passionate hope for a better world. If I had the opportunity to speak with my pastor friend who, who had had it with the talks about racism, I would hope for the opportunity to tell him that his long game is beautiful. And I'd encourage him not to, in, not to abandon it. And friends, friends, let me encourage you to do the same. The urge to react and take shortcuts is going to be strong in the coming days, but the best possible things are often the ones that are hardest to see in the present. And who knows what kind of value you might add to your relationships and positive change you might bring to people's lives in the days ahead.